The Lure at the Falls, Niagara Falls, Ontario. Sometimes a person who's still very much alive haunts a place with his or her disturbing behavior. Francis Abbott, a mysterious young Englishman who came to be known as the Hermit of Niagara, was just such a person. Niagara Falls had already become a famous tourist attraction when Abbott appeared there in June 1829. Visitors from across North America and abroad were coming to marvel at the world wonder they had heard so much about. For many, gazing at the Niagara River, racing toward the brink and spilling down into the roaring whirlpool below was, and still is, almost a hypnotic experience. Perhaps for Abbott it was. Abbott stood out when he first showed up in town on the American side of the falls. Tall and well built, he punctuated his long strides with a gentleman's walking cane. He wore a long brown cloak that flowed out behind him as he walked, but his feet were bare. Abbott checked into a single room at a small inn with just a few possessions. A bedroll, a book, a soft case like those in which artists carry, drawing, drawing pads and supplies, and a flute. Planning to stay about a week, Abbott quickly changed his mind. As he explained to the library a new man just a nearby reading room, he found the combination of the falls incredible, incredible beauty and terrifying power both overwhelming and irresistible. He had traveled widely across Europe, but had never before been so strongly moved by a place. He wanted to experience the falls to the full for at least six months, and he wanted to do it alone. Abbott quickly drew up plans for a little cabin. He wanted to build it on one of the Three Sisters, small islands on the river above the falls, just south of the, of the much larger Goat, or Goat Island. The plans included a drawbridge that he would pull up to keep anyone walking around Goat Island at bay. He was refused permission to build on any of the sisters, but Augustus Porter, Goat Island's owner, said he could stay in a small existing log cabin on the Big Island. Excited, Abbott packed up his flute, a, vi a violin he had just bought, and some basic supplies, and headed across the bridge from the U.S. mainland to his new home. Mostly he kept to himself. At times he wouldn't answer when people tried to speak to him, but he wasn't rude or angry, just silent. He played his flute, his violin, and a guitar that he bought later. The haunting strange of his music would drift through the trees until they could no longer be heard above the roar of the falls. He composed a little music and he wrote a lot. According to some people, he wrote only in Latin and threw anything he'd written as soon as he was finished. He got a cat and a dog and walked with the dog around the island and whenever the mood struck, and it struck often, he went to the river, getting as close to the rapids and the falls as possible. A narrow bridge jutted out from the southwest corner of Goat Island, linking it to a solid pile of large rock known as the Terrapin Rocks. At the end of the bridge, there was a thick section of timber that jutted out beyond the rocks above the eastern edge of the Horseshoe Falls on the Canadian side of the river. Only the most daring of tourists walked out on that bridge, and they didn't linger there. Under the rapids raced toward the edge of the falls, leaving them trembling with fear at the possibility of the bridge collapsing or of the rails giving way. That's where Abbott would go to get close to the water. He would walk out on the bridge barefoot, his long hair framing his face. He would cross the bridge and, step by step, walk out on the wooden beam. Some days he would pace, some days he would pace back and forth on it for hours. Occasionally, he would stand perfectly still on it, balanced on one foot, or sit on it, his legs swinging over the edge. Sometimes he would go right to the end of the beam, kneel, slip down over the side of it, and, holding on with both hands, dangle over the roaring, mystery whirlpool beneath the horseshoe falls. People on the island and at look at points on the Canadian side of the falls would cry out in horror, but he seemed to be oblivious to the danger he was in. He once told someone in town that he wasn't doing anything more dangerous than a sailor who climbed high up on high up the rigging of a, of a ship during a storm. He also said that he wanted to rid himself of all fear. Abbott eventually had to move out of the cabin on Goat Island, but he didn't leave Niagara. He built himself a hut on the American shore near a ferry landing, and every morning, even in the winter, when the chunks of ice floated by, he would go for a swim in the river. But one June morning in 1831, two years after he had come to town, he went swimming three times, and the third time, he didn't come back. A ferry operator who saw him dive in noticed that he seemed to stay underwater for a very long time. But he was used to Abbott's strange behavior. It took him a few minutes to realize that the Englishman had disappeared and to send out a call for a search party. Abbott's body was swept down the river and over the edge into the whirlpool, and there it stayed, day after a hor horrifying day, rescuers struggled to reach it as crowds peered through the mist to watch it surface briefly before it was sucked back under the swirling eddies. Finally, after 11 days, it was recovered and buried in Oakwood, Cem Oakwood Cemetery in Niagara Falls, New York. At last, Francis Abbott was free of Niagara's spell, but perhaps the falls will never quite be free of Abbott's.